Yeah, so it's interesting. I, I kind of uh, went back to St. Athanasius, and, and I also read the, the Golden Legend, uh, which is, was shorter, the, the, the section, the chapter about Anthony. Um, but I went back to St. Athanasius' account and kind of tracked the development of these different encounters with with demons. And it's really interesting, you know, first of all, first of all they're not uh, appearing to him in outward form. They're tempting him in his imagination. Then you get these wild beasts. Really only once uh, later on in the story do you get a, a, a monstrous creature that's a mix of different things, uh, which is which is usually what's portrayed in, uh, in visual art. Uh, but I thought maybe uh, I won't read, you know, everything, all the notes I, I took down here, but uh, because I can come back to specific points later. But I'd like to start with um, a little bit from this, the kind of the first instance of attacks from the devil. So... The devil, Athanasius says, Anthony is still young at this point. The devil is dismayed that someone so young is uh, taking on this very holy ascetical life. So uh, the devil, quote, first tried to draw him away from the ascetical life by suggesting the memory of his property, because Anthony had been uh, from fairly wealthy parents, anxiety about his sister, because Anthony was left to take care of his sister after his parents died, intimacy with his kindred, greed for money and for power, the manifold enjoyment of food and the other pleasures of life. So as you say, these, these, are, these are pretty normal uh, ones starting off. Uh, and finally, the rigor of virtue and the great labor it entailed. He also hinted at the weakness of the body and the duration of time. In a word, he gathered up in his mind a great dust cloud of arguments wishing to withdraw him from his upright purpose. And then when this doesn't work, uh, Athanasius says, the devil, quote, then placed his confidence in the weapons in the navel of his belly, glorying in them, for they are the fir his first snares against the young. So at this point, the devil is tempting him with lust so much by night and day that even onlookers notice that Anthony is clearly struggling, fighting with the devil here. Um, he even takes the form of a woman at night, and Anthony gets rid of this illusion by, quote, meditating on Christ and the nobility uh, that is ours through Christ and the spiritual nature of the soul. He suggests this, the softness of pleasure to Anthony, and Anthony counters this by meditating on punishment by fire and the torment of the worm. And then uh, later on, uh, the devil comes with a whole throng of demons and cuts him with lashes and leaves him lying on the ground in intense pain. So here we have the beginnings of uh, with this woman appearing to him and these demons physically attacking him. You have the beginnings of uh, the beginnings of these these temptations, and then continuing on when he's about thirty-five, this is where you get the animals coming in. So he, first, he, the animals are just making tons of noise. That the devil fills the place with forms of lions, bears, leopards, bulls, serpents, apes, asps, scorpions, and wolves, each of which was behaving in its natural manner. Anthony says to them gaily, "If you had any, any power, it would have been." enough for one of you to come, but because the Lord has deprived you of your strength, you therefore try to frighten me by your numbers. That you take the shape of beasts is proof of your weakness. Then looking up, he sees the roof opening, a ray of light comes down, the pain in his body stops, and he asks the Lord, where were you? Why didn't you appear at the beginning? The Lord says he was there and was waiting to see Anthony struggle, and because Anthony was steadfast, he will always be his helper and will make his name, name known everywhere. Uh, so I just wanted to sort of say all that as kind of a, because that, that gives us a fair amount of, uh, reference point for all the different works of art we're going to see. A lot of the basic, mm -hmm. the basic information is contained in those accounts of his first two assaults, first when he's young, and then when he's 35, the more outlandish things start, start happening. So we see um, at, at the beginning, we, we just we just have the array of the you know, seven deadly sins, exactly. essentially. Yeah. And so we see that the, the mm, sort of Dante-esque almost used the lust for power, lust for women. And then um, I think it's interesting, this attempting to um, remove himself from the environment or circumstances that he would perceive as sinful i.e life in the city right because we're talking about these, these city environments he tries to go out into the countryside and there's a whole body of literature this thebiad of of men who have gone out including the 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 friendship that's that's described um 
between Anthony and uh, Paul of Thebes, but there's a whole body of people who move out into the desert around Thebes in order to live a holier life. But um, despite the fact that they they think they've removed themselves from the material temptations of wealth, of other people, of, of, of food, of gluttony, envy, the, the temptations still return, and they return uh, in the form of this more demonic temptation, which is which takes the form of these hallucinations or these 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 visions that he has. So it's a reminder, I think, in many ways, um, Saint Anthony's story is that it's there's just no escaping temptation, um, but also this this the the the. The adversary is very strong uh, when he fights Anthony, and yet Anthony succeeds in uh, in in quelling this um, very very powerful uh, physical attack. I mean, we hear about him left wounded, in pain, suffering, right? Yeah. Well, it's interesting. So, yeah, as you say, it starts out with these kind of the these baseline vices that he's being tempted with. Um, and when when the devil sees that he can't tempt him in this way, pretty much for the rest of the story, what he's doing is just trying to daunt him, trying to frighten him, try, sometimes trying to disorient and confuse him, because not only is he attacked by uh, wild beasts and demons, but he's also, you know, occasionally the devil will appear in the form of a monk and start chanting or quoting scripture. And, and Anthony isn't, isn't uh, you know, he always comes with complete confidence uh, and uh, sort of uh, dispels dispels the demons in various ways, and and later in time, you know, uh, people are as more people are joining him out in, out in the desert or trying to join him or learn from him, you know, they're seeing some of these things happen, and he he has to advise them, and he basically just gives them the advice to to be completely confident and make the sign of the cross, and uh, and kind of uh, just just be completely unfazed by these things. And, and in the end, you know, uh, the devil actually appears to him and, and is honest with him for once and says, look, why does, why does everybody blame all their problems on me? I just take what people are already thinking and, and amplify it. Or I, I just attack the points where they're vulnerable. And, uh, you know, I have no power in myself and Anthony at this point, uh, this is late in life. Anthony, marvels at the goodness of God and says, you know, you're the father of lies, but in this case, you, you have been forced to tell the truth against your will, uh, because, um, because yeah, because of Christ's death on the cross, you have no power. And so this is basically Anthony's attitude, uh, the whole time. And, and he's, he's vindicated. I, I, I wanted to say that up front because, you know, when we're looking at so many, so many of these depictions, uh, it can be easy to, in some of them, it can be the 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 canvas is so dominated by all these crazy demons and outlandish creatures and spectacle uh, that if you don't know the story and how Anthony responded, it can be easy to be just see it as kind of a grotesquerie. But uh, if you kind of know how Anthony responded, then you can look at the figure of Anthony as small as it may be on some of these in some of these paintings and kind of see. Uh, in many cases, his indifference to what's going on around him. Uh, so, so it's good to kind of know that the full context in his his spiritual uh, his spiritual response here, which is given more explicitly or less, depending on which painting you may be looking at. I think it's um, I think it's interesting to see how different artists portray Anthony's reaction. I think there are different reactions on the part of Anthony. Sometimes Anthony um, uh, turns towards some image of, of Christ or the cross, but sometimes you see him really almost buried alive under this, right. the sheer weight of the creatures. And I think another very important thing that you just mentioned is the the way that this temptation works is not only that of presenting the the deadly sins or the kind of physical torment, but um, the uh, the arrival of a friendly face, a friendly mind. In, in, in a wonderful painting um, in, um, in a wonderful painting by Buffalmaco 
in uh, Pisa, uh, you have the Thebaid and you have a monk going to visit another one. He's wearing the big kind of cloak, but you see underneath it the little hoof of a demon who's coming in mm. to steer him wrong. This is to bring wrong teaching or to, you know, stir up trouble by saying, oh, you know what's going on in Rome? I mean, this, this idea of kind of creating a kind of a blip in that certainty of his faith. And then also at the very beginning, uh, one of the things that uh, Anthony is tempted, one of the ways they tempt Anthony is that you know, it's going to take, the man lives to be a hundred years old, right? So you got a hundred years of this ahead of you and it's going to stink. I mean, there are interesting ways that temptation works and really the, the story of Athanasius really tries to remind people that temptation comes in many, many different forms. Another interesting thing about Anthony also is the fact that he seems to be the saint who kind of rejects the um, hyper literate world. I mean, granted, the percentage of people who actually could read in the fourth century is very low, but there's a kind of a hyper literate world of people arguing about meaning and senses and the gospels and they're, you know, writing treatises back and forth and everybody's got their, you've got this huge body of writing that's creating confusion. And Anthony really just rejects all that. He, he follows people that he sees in his, in the period of his preparation, he follows people that he sees are good and true. He listens very carefully when the scripture is read and he carries it in with him. And so he's a, he's a self-contained being. So for all of his attributes, he's actually a self-contained body of scripture of what he remembers. His memory is, is prodigious. His belief that is unshaken by the, you know, competing doctrines or interviews or whatever it is that people are giving that are creating confusion within the church. Very, very interesting character from that point of view. It really is a presentation of how simple confidence can bring sainthood.